All right, it's the week of August 19th, and I'm out here looking at the cotton, and I have some worrying news. Let me get over to where I can show it best on row one. But if you look down in here, my hypotheses have been confirmed. There is some sort of soil nutrient um, limitation here, and it's severely affecting productivity. I don't know how well to show up, but these plants on row one have quite a bit of chlorosis. That's this whitening along the axial vein of the leaves, and it also extends to some of the bowls. And wherever you see these yellowings of the bowls, that bowl is done. Like that, gone. That, gone. The plant is getting rid of that bowl. It has made the voluntary decision to kill that fruit for the sake of its production for the year. Which means there is a mobile nutrient inside of the fruit that the plant needs for fruit production, and it is voluntarily not allowing itself to retain any more fruit than it already has in order to facilitate the growth of the pre-existing fruits. Because if you look over here at this plant, this is 212. It doesn't actually have too bad of chlorosis, but this is that one that was notorious for dropping bowls that I was talking about last week. You can see some of them down there. You know, there's at least five bowls, six bowls down there. Here's another one that's going. That one was actually rather far along. Some of these bowls, as they're being dropped, are actually splitting, and there may be viable seeds in them. But, there's no lint. And any viable seeds in there are going to be stunted. So that is not good for productivity, whether seed or lint. But if you look down here to the some of the older fruits, they look just fine. There's no chlorosis, and that's because the plant is not pulling nutrients from these. The plant is pulling nutrients from less important locations on the plant and pumping them down here into these. So once I determine what this nutrient is, I need to come out here and supplement fertilization on row two and three since these are the fertilized rows. And at this point, I'm probably just gonna fertilize the whole lot because I need the, the seed production this year. My best guess for what this is, is potassium, because based on the signs I'm seeing, and I'm going to preface this by saying, I am not a farmer, I am not an agriculturalist, I am not a soil scientist, I am just going purely off of conjecture and what little I got in college that I still remember. I believe this is a potassium deficiency, because I know in cotton, potassium is critical to fruit development. And if these plants are not getting potassium, then they're going to start pulling potassium from unproductive fruits or newer fruits, and dropping them so that they can pump it into the older fruits so that they can at least get the older fruits to develop totally. So, and you see how this is being pulled from old growth? This chlorosis is happening down here on the oldest leaves and it's happening immediately near the, the axes of the leaves, which means that the, this is a mobile nutrient that is being pulled out of old growth and put into new growth. And potassium, as far as I can remember, is a mobile nutrient. Unlike some things like, say, sulfur that are immobile. So when the plant needs more of that, it can't just suck it out of old growth and put it into new growth. Uh, another mobile nutrient would be nitrogen. That's why when you see a plant that's nitrogen deficient, typically the old leaves are yellow and the new leaves are bright and green because it's sucking the nitrogen out of the old leaves and putting them into the new leaves because old leaves are less photosynthetically productive than the new ones. When you see something with like a sulfur deficiency, it's usually the new growth that's, or a sulfur or an iron deficiency, it's usually the new growth that has chlorosis and it's a little yellow because the plant can't, can't pull all of the nutrient out of the leaf. So that's that's a major issue. So I'm gonna have to come out here and I'm gonna have to supplement fertilization on this stuff. I'm hoping it's potassium. I'm pretty sure it's potassium, but I'm gonna have to look this up. 
and I think I can do that with a foliar spray. Another interesting thing that I've noticed is, once again, I do not think this is um, weather related or otherwise soil related, because it seems to be, it seem, the amount of chlorosis seems to be directly related to the size of the plant and the intensity that nutrients were extracted from the soil. Because these over here are very large plants, and they have, well, this guy in particular has a lot of chlorosis. And he has a lot of bulls, and he's been fruiting the longest, which means that it's been pulling potassium out of the soil longer than any of the other plants. Now, I also noticed that it's much stronger on row one than it is on row four, which to me indicates that it's a nutrient that is also um, highly mobile in the soil. So it's a nutrient that dissolves in water readily and then runs down into the groundwater and out of the soil, which potassium does. Because row one is has more chlorosis that since this was irrigated early on during establishment and that was not that tells me that before the plants established I leached a lot of potassium out of these hills and the plants no longer have access to it because it ran off and if you look over here at row three where I have this stretch of four transplanted plants for the most part they have almost no chlorosis. It gets a little bad here the closer we get to this untransplanted plant, but by all means it looks just fine, and there's very little dropped bulls, if any, on these transplanted plants. And that's because the plants that were here all died. So they didn't get a chance to pull nutrients out of the soil, and I wasn't watering these because the plants were dead. So when I transplanted these plants in, they came from an area where they had already sucked all the nutrients out and went to an area where there were plenty of nutrients to suck out. So they're actually doing better than some of the other plants because they have access to more nutrients relative because they established an area with plenty of nutrients and they got moved to an area that still had plenty of nutrients. So the net amount of nutrients that they have available is roughly the same. Also because I overwatered these because they got transplanted so there was probably a good bit of leaching going on there. But that's my theory, I'm gonna look into it. Hopefully it's just potassium. I'm gonna look to see if I can do a foliar spray with potassium if I can, that'd be great. If I have to do a soil application, then fine, whatever. But that's where we are, a lot of drop bowls. So production is probably going to be fairly low per plant unless I can do something about it in the interim because we're losing a lot of bowls very quickly. We're not losing old bowls, which means we're still gonna have some product, but we're losing, we're not gaining any new bulls. So that's got me a bit worried. Alrighty, we're back out at the plot. And after doing some research today, I'm pretty sure I know what the nutrient deficiency is. And I was flat wrong, not potassium. The symptoms for potassium look like how Lori's plants at McLeod looked, which is actually surprising to me because from what she was telling me, she was it sounded like she was over fertilizing them with potassium, but all of the symptoms seemed to indicate low potassium, so her soil might just be really funny in comparison. But no, that is not the case. This flaring of the bulls and then subsequent dropping of the bulls along with chlorosis, this is all a symptom of boron deficiency. Now, I know what you might be thinking, you astute, astute viewer. Tom, didn't you fertilize with boron at the beginning, uh, following recommendations from your local agricultural extension? And you would be correct, I did. I fertilized with, I fertilized with orthoboric acid across the entire 625 square foot plot according to the recommendations of my local extension agency. However, I did so before I formed the hills. If you remember, I sprayed the entire plot immediately after it was tilled. Then I formed the beds about a month and a half later. So I believe that the majority of the boric acid is inaccessible to the plants because it was either washed away or because it's simply buried out of reach down in the alleys or something like that. Cotton is a particularly boron sensitive plant because as I learned today, boron is absolutely critical in the development of the bulls and the cotton needs the boron to hold onto the bulls. 
I've also been able to tell that the cotton might be a little low in phosphorus, maybe some other stuff, but really not in any capacity that I'm interested in. I think this chlorosis that I've been noticing down on the leaves, this chlorosis I've been noticing on some of the older leaves, particularly this intervenal chlorosis, and it's more a whitening than a chlorosis. I believe that to be a symptom of either a continuation of the boron deficiency symptoms or a symptom of manganese deficiency. So as a precaution, I'm going to be adding an ounce of manganese sulfate in addition to an ounce of orthoboric acid in a foliar spray across the plants. In order to do that, I'm going to have to go get the sprayer and I have to clean it out of any herbicide. Just, you know, run a couple gallons of water through it and then thoroughly clean out the, the spraying apparatus. And then any traces in there shouldn't make a difference. And then at that point, I'm going to do a foliar spray across the entire plot. And that should hopefully rectify the issue with the shed young bulls because this is just not sustainable. And that also means that I am, I've probably lost the last two, three weeks of flowers. And it, I'm probably going to lose the next couple of flowers after that. The This current week, last week, and the week before that, whenever I started noticing um, the shedding of bulls, from that point forward, I don't think any of the plants are going to retain much of the bulls except for the younger ones. These extra fecund ones, their fecundity is going to be reduced because of this, which is annoying for my data. But yeah, I don't... My other Overall, the cotton looks really good. I don't notice any other glaring deficiencies. I mean, they're a, a little bit yellow... So they might need some of the macronutrients again, just to help make up for some of the other deficiencies in the soil. I don't really think that potassium or phosphorus are much of an issue. The soil was really only low in nitrogen. So that, that could be something that I could look at. The, there is some yellowing of the older leaves, which is indicative of a little bit of a nitrogen deficiency. One other thing I'm noticing on some of these plants back here is this, this reddening of the leaves as well as chlorosis, and I think that is a symptom of either magnesium or potassium deficiency, but that's really only appearing on some of the older leaves of some of the older plants. I don't really see it too much on the majority of the crop. Now look at that chlorosis. This sort of chlorosis may also be indicative of zinc deficiency, but all the photos I see, it's much more intervenal. This is on the veins, which has not been a symptom I've been able to document. The closest thing I can see is a lot of the, the stuff with boron deficiency has really prominent veins. So that's what I'm going with. Well, other than the drop bowls, the drop bowls is a dead giveaway. I have my, I have my answer, and hopefully I found the solution, so I'm going to try that and hopefully I'll be able to recover this crop. The stuff that's currently developing should be fine. It might come out a little bit deteriorated because of the lack of boron, but I think the really early stuff should be all right. Let's get to spraying. So I'm out here with the weed eater and the sprayer and I've got an ounce of orthoboric acid and three quarters of an ounce of manganese sulfate. So I'm going to mix both of those up in the sprayer with probably a half gallon of water, maybe a gallon, I don't know, I'll have to work that out. I don't know how much I'm going to need to cover all of the plants. I don't want to do a gallon and then have too much and then have to coat the plants twice because most of that's just going to run off. Uh, but I don't want to do a half gallon and not have enough because then I won't get even coverage. I need to get boron and all the plants evenly. I've also got the weed eater out here and I'm going to weed eat through the alleys and around the bed again because we just had the parking lot cut and it doesn't it looks stupid if I don't. Also I washed that thing out about 12 times. I did three passes through the sprayer itself which doesn't need as many because it passes more water through it but I rinsed out the sprayer itself about a dozen times so any traces of herbicide that are in there should be so minor that it won't make a difference or I'll kill all of the cotton. One of the two. Alright now that I'm done weed eating, and the plot looks nice and clean. I am going to be adding the boric acid and the magnesium sulfate to my 
sprayer and then I'm going to put a half gallon in there and I'm gonna see how that looks um, I feel like a half gallon is not gonna be enough but a gallon just seems like it'll be an excess for what I need to do but a gallon's probably the safer bet I just don't want to saturate the plants and then have to continue spraying um, because at that point they're I'll just be spraying into the dirt basically and it would probably be better if I just sprayed it directly onto the base of the plants instead of on the leaves. But we're going to go with a half gallon, we're going to see how that looks and then we'll up that to a gallon if we need to. So I'm going to get to mixing. Well the boron's pretty much well and thoroughly dissolved so I guess now it's time to add the manganese. Well. I can't quite tell if it's all dissolved or not. It looks a bit cloudy. I don't know if this stuff forms some sort of precipitate or something. I don't know, but went up to about two-thirds of a gallon. Um, yeah, it looks to be all dissolved. I did check the solubility, and um, it was... I think I could do, like, one pound of manganese per gallon and about ounce and a half, two ounces of orthoboric acid per gallon. So I'm well under the solubility of mounts, even if I include both together, unless they sort of do some sort of weird interaction in solution that causes one to precipitate out or form some sort of other ionic salt, I don't know. So hopefully it's not doing something horrible in there that'll kill the plants. If I was smart, I probably would have just done each individually one, one day before the other, but I'm lazy and I like to live dangerously. Pumps full and pumped, and just as I started to begin spraying, well, just as I was about to begin spraying, wind started picking up, so I'm gonna have to hurry up and do this. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to film myself spraying because I need to really be a paying. I need to really be paying attention to what I'm doing, so I don't run out of spray too soon. And I also have to monitor this wind and hold the sprayer while spraying. So can't really do that while holding my phone. All right, so I just did one application. Uh, I've still got about half the tank left, so we're gonna go back and we're gonna do another pass. Uh, what, By the way, what I'm doing is I'm doing foliar feeding. So I'm spraying the micronutrients directly onto the leaf surface and the leaves will be able to absorb it through the cuticle, which is which means that the application, the micronutrients um, get to the plant more effectively. They get to the, vid, they get to the above ground part of the plant more efficiently. Um, there's not quite as much um, nutrient spread to the roots, so it's not as um, homogenous throughout the tissues of the plant, so it does have that downside, but it's the plants initially get much more nutrition directly where they need it, but there isn't any available in the soil in the future, so this is sort of just like a topical treatment, and I may need to come out here and further soil fertilize with boron, but this is sort of a panic last minute thing, so I'm just hoping this will work. I'm also hoping I've thoroughly washed out all the herbicide. I know I'm worrying about that. There's like statistically like some incredibly minor, minute concentration of herbicide that's still in this tank that it should make a difference. One other thing that I'm not thrilled about is I'm spraying orthoboric acid, which is essentially an insecticide. It's used as an insecticide. It's roach and ant killer. So I'm not terribly thrilled about that because I'm going to be hurting a lot of the beneficial insects, but is, this is absolutely necessary to keep the, the cotton producing. So should be a decline in the ant population, the ladybug population, and the um, aphid population, and the aphid population will rebound and the ladybugs will supplant it. But since I'm doing such a small plot in the long run, it shouldn't be much of a, much of a problem. I'm going to get back to spraying now. All right, everything's been sprayed. Let me look over here. Sprayer is empty. And it ended up having just exactly enough. I probably should have done three quarters of a gallon, but I did two thirds and that was just enough. And after I finished spraying everything, I started spritzing over there at the end of row four after the second pass. And then I went through with what little was remaining and I sort of did a basal foliar spray on three and two and some of four did not have enough to do one and I, I sprayed indiscriminately across the entire foliage I think what I was reading was saying to do a basal foliar spray which I think would mean you'd 
go by and you just spray the base which makes sense from what I understand uh, the boron isn't particularly modal while it's when it's in a foliar application so spraying basally gets it straight to the vasculature and the already developing bowls so that any excess can go up and throughout and um, what is needed where it is needed goes where it needs right then at the base where the bowls are but considering how the majority of my shed bowls are up at the top far away from the roots because I'm guessing the the boron is going where it is needed quickly it's coming up the stem and then going into the earliest bowls and it's not getting up to the canopy where you see I'm having the majority of these dead bowls proportionally more towards the top so I think a foliar spray is probably just an indiscriminate one is probably the best thing to do considering I've never done a foliar spray before and I don't really know what I'm doing so just as assurance just coat the whole plant um, do so at the recommended um, amount so I think I did a little bit more boron than I, I did a uh, 20% more or 25% more than I did initially as a foliar spray, but I have not exceeded the maximum recommended. So we'll see how that does next week. All right, it's the next day and we're back out at the cotton patch because one of our volunteers told me I had blue cotton. Well, he told his wife that I had blue cotton and then forgot to tell me. So she came in and said, hey, why is your cotton blue? And I was like, oh, Lord of mercy. So I'm out here seeing why and how the cotton's blue and it looks like my hopes have been met because I was under the assumption that the cotton was probably or it was the cotton flowers were blue and it was my assumption that it was probably just the flowers that were open yesterday that became stained blue by the boron and the manganese you can see a vague amount of that now um, yeah, it's more gray now, but if I look at yesterday's flowers, there's a couple of little spots of blue on them. Which makes sense, because both manganese and boron are used to some extent to make blue dyes. So spraying a, um, an ionic mixture of both boron and manganese directly onto some very ephemeral, paper-thin flowers would probably stain them blue. And let's see, is there any on here? You can make out a little wisp of the blue coloration on there, but not much. So that's what I was hoping to see was nothing on the new flowers and really only nothing more than a tint. This is good. Another thing to good, that's good to know is that the cotton doesn't look dead. Doesn't look red at all, doesn't look black at all, doesn't look white at all, doesn't look extra blue at all. You can see the little flecks on there where the salts are still on the surface of the leaf, but I don't see any obvious leaf damage yet, which I would hope not to see, and I wouldn't expect to see. Here's a smidge more of that blue, but not really any blue today. So it's good to see. Um, cotton does look a little bit like it's getting yellow, which might indicate that it's low on um, nitrogen, but I'm not going to supplementally feed that nitrogen. It can deal with it. I am going to feed a boron, though. You see, this one's got some more blue tinge, but noth nothing as striking as I was hoping to see. Well, nothing as striking as I expected to see. It's about as striking as I hoped to see, which was not much at all. So, you'll hear back again next week, unless the cotton turns blue again, because that's when I should hope to see any alleviation of the symptoms. If I come back in a week and it doesn't look like there's any drop, new drop bowls, and it's, you know, nothing that looks like this, or let's say this, or this, this one not so much, that one's only a little bit yellow, but as long as I don't see any more of that, that to me should indicate, or like that, that's what I'm really worried about, is I don't want to see any more of that. It's fine if I see more of this, because those bulls that you see now that are like that are going to turn into that as the plant senesces them. 
But as long as I don't see any more of that chlorosis on the bowls, that means that the, uh, the manganese and boron feeding took and I shouldn't lose any more crop unless I start to notice those symptoms again, in which case I might have to come out here and supplementally feed. Although I have kind of fed to the maximum recommended amount, so it may not be good to feed them again. Or I might be able to get away with another minor fe feeding. Time shall tell. Alright, it's the following week, and let me get to where my shadow's not in the way. And as you can probably see, the fuller application of boron and manganese has solved the problem. So that's good to see. And here's kind of... So that's not going to work. Here, let me find a good example. I had one over here. Here we go. And this is a prime demonstration of how I know it worked. Here is a dead bull that has been senesced and dropped because it did not have enough boron, and then immediately down the line from it is a healthy, new, fresh bull that is not showing any obvious signs of chlorosis. So what that tells me is the chlorosis and drop bull issue stopped right there with that bull, and it's now picking back up. The plant now has sufficient micronutrients. So that's fantastic to see, and you can see this here as well. Down here, completely senesced, drop, bowl. Right here, damaged, chlorized bowl, being dropped. Then here, perfectly healthy bowl, beginning to develop. So, that proves to me that the application of manganese and boron has solved the problem, specifically the boron. I've also noticed that the chlorosis I was observing last week has sort of decreased see it a little bit here it's there's like some sort of scarring on the leaf now but the whitening is no longer readily apparent it's sort of turned to just like a yellow scar tissue in the leaf and I've been noticing that on pretty much all the plants I've been investigating so let's see like over here on row one you know I think one at this one right here had that really bad chlorosis it's still there but it's less white now it's more yellow and it's not really observable on any of the newer growth which is encouraging which is encouraging and this row was the row with the worst proportional drop bowl and chlorosis issue and as you can see there's pretty much no yellow bowls anymore and no new chlorosis and another thing i'm noticing is all the plants are much deeper blue or green than they were last week. And I, I had mentioned that, that a lot of the plants look like they were kind of yellowy in their new foliage. They were more like this. They are more like this than this, because that's what we want to see, that deep bluish green really signifies nutritional health of the plant. And I've noticed that all the plants now look like that. So, what what I did solved the problem. Hopefully. At least, as far as I can tell, the problem is solved. So, that's, that's what I'm glad to see. All right, back out here real quick, because I went back to the office, did a little bit of research, and realized I'd mixed up something with the micronutrients. I had um, conflated, um, two things together, so I wanted to clear that up real quick. I had stated before how I noticed how the leaves appeared to be a lot more blue than they were before. They seemed to be a lot healthier looking. They weren't as uh, yellowy. And I said that might have been something to do with the boron or manganese. I don't think it was that at all. I think it was the sulfur, because I completely forgot that there was sulfate in the manganese sulfate, which I went and looked up the symptoms of um, sulfur deficiency, and they look a lot like this leaf chlorosis that I was worried about. And more, well, that's, I looked up what they look like in okra, and it looks a lot like this leaf chlorosis, and okra is also a malvid. So that's, that's interesting to note. But what they look like in cotton 
is it's typically it sort of looks like a um, like a nitrogen deficiency except it's in new growth instead of in old growth it's sort of the inverse of the nitrogen deficiency where nitrogen the old leaves get yellow and sulfur the new leaves get yellow because sulfur is not a mobile nutrient so I think that might have actually been the sulfur that helped out the overall appearance of the plants and not so much the manganese although I would like to think the manganese helped because if if these plants had a boron deficiency and I fertilized them with both manganese and boron in the same way then it stands to reason that they would have a manganese deficiency as well and the logical step that I did not take there is it also would stand that they would have a sulfur deficiency as well because this plot had a minor sulfur sulfur deficiency that I amended for with the calcium sulfate and the manganese sulfate and I completely forgot to factor that in so that's probably why the leaves were looking a bit yellow and one last thing I want to talk about 44D because it is now the the reigning champion plant compared to the rest of the plot before 44D was lacking in the fact that it was not as fecund as over here on the end of 2 and 3. However, 44D has been the largest plant for at least two weeks running now. It's 57 and a half inches tall this week, and I think the next tallest is one of those two plants at 55. I think it was that plant. So he's two and a half inches taller than any of the other plants. And this week, it was the most fecund, and it actually had the highest flower count of any plant recorded thus far. It had 15 flowers this week, and the next highest was 11 this week, and the previous highest record was 12, so that's interesting to note. So that's a good sign that this plant has some really good genetics. Like, if, if it's this big, and it's producing that many flowers, and it's on the worst row nutrient-wise, this has no macronutrient fertilization and, and the same micronutrient fertilization. It's also on an edge, which means it's got higher weed competition, but it's doing this good. And additionally, 2-1 is doing really good. It had a really high fecundity this week too. And by all means, 2-1 should be doing poorly. And it's not the tallest plant. It's 51 and a half inches tall, but it's in the top 15% of all of the plants. Actually, I think there's only four plants that are doing better than it. No, I think there's only three plants that are doing better than it, and one plant that's doing the same. But this week, this one had 11 flowers, and it being on the front of the row, that should mean it's in the same sort of situation as 44D, in that 21A should be competing very strongly with weeds, and it's getting a full bath of sunlight all day, every day, which means it should be really water stressed, especially with the weed competition. However, it does have the advantage of that if it, it got a full macronutrient fertilization suite. So that's what 44D has going for it over 21A. But these are both two really standout plants. And I would like to say the same for these at the back of these rows, but considering they're at the back of the row, they have um, a really good tolerance against uh, moisture loss and weed competition, especially since the implants died for each, which means these last guys got an extra bonus. So they've got the least water and heat stress and like and reduced weed competition. However, both of these have had issues with nutrient acquisition efficiency. So I'll have to watch them. They're still probably going to be the most fecund. They're definitely the most mature. They'll have the first bowls, I almost guarantee. So, we'll be watching them. Also, I learned the other day that these are nectaries. These are actually voluntary holes in the bottom of the leaf axles that the plants use to attract ants that then control aphids and cockroaches and grasshoppers and other pests for the plant as well as things like cutworms and all that. So I had always thought that these were scars created by the ants, but it's they're on every leaf and they're in the same place on every leaves. And that's a little too accurate for ants. You know, ants are a highly complex social insect, but they're not that precise. You know, they tend to do things randomly out of order sometimes, but this is in the same place every time on every plant in this ant. 
biting the snot out of me. Till then, Tom out.